Good morning, everybody. Just welcome you here this morning, those watching online. Um, this meeting, town meeting, is very important because I don't know if you're paying attention. Did you see this week in Utah, a district in Utah, they passed the law that a Bible is not allowed because the Bible uh, proclaims vulgar and violent things in the Bible. And they, and they this, this district in Utah passed that law. Why? Because nobody stood up against it. So Brenda, thank you for informing us. We need to, that's one man. That's one man on that board. But he needs us, the support of other people that he stands up for what is right. And we just thank the Lord for that. <clears throat> I got a story this morning. You know, Earl is, um, he's got these secret fishing spots and everything. He's, he just got, it was well, anyway, I said to Earl, Earl, let's I and you go out fishing, because I found this great fishing spot. So I said, Earl, let's go out. I, I found this because I seen where a storm had taken a tree down and kind of blocked the road. So, um, so before we, we went there and before we started to fish, I made up a sign and I put it on the back of Earl's truck. It said, the end is near, stop, make a U-turn before it's too late. Well, a car come driving down and uh, I pointed at the sign on the back of Earl's truck and the driver slowed down and hollered back at me. You religious nuts drive me crazy. Mind your own business. A moment later, we, I, we didn't respond to him. A moment later, we heard a splash. And so I said to Earl, do you think we should put on that sign, um, the bridge is out? <laughs> <laughs> so... Sometimes you got to read into things more than what you think. So, so we're going to take up tithes and offerings this morning. Um, are, you, are you ready to receive this morning? Are you ready to honor the Lord this morning? You know, um, <clears throat> last week we talked about giving. Giving should have a purpose. And what, what is that purpose? It's how, it's not how. You know, we looked at 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 8. It's not how to give. In verse 7, it's not how to give. It tells us how to give and not to give. In the verse 7, it says, so he purpose, we should purpose in our heart to give. You know, that's an inward choice. You have a choice. You should have that purpose in your heart. And the other thing is, not grudgingly. If you're going to give grudgingly, you shouldn't do it. Again, that's a choice. And it's the inward part of the heart. And are out of necessity. You know, what do you mean by out of necessity? Is it because somebody's putting pressure on you? Well, I see that you tied, but you don't. That's, that's outward pressure. So we shouldn't be looking at that. We should be given as a, uh, a purpose. And then the very last thing is, you should be a cheerful giver. If you're not a cheerful giver, you shouldn't give. You should not give. Just keep it, because God doesn't want it if you're not a cheerful giver. So, um, Debbie, you want to come this morning and lead us in our prayers and worship song as we give unto the Lord this morning. It is our opportunity that we can honor the Lord. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. The Abraham's blessings are mine. You know, when we make the confessions, you, you may feel, oh, that's not true. But faith comes by hearing the word of God and by hearing yourself say the word of God. Yeah. So we thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray your blessings over these tithes and offerings. We just thank you that we can come before you 
and we could honor you this morning with tithes and offerings for planting the seed, Lord, that we know a harvest comes after the seed. So we give you all the honor and glory this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Pastor Jan. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. He is good. Good. Whoops, I need something. I need something off of there, Debbie, first. My little pendulum. What did I do? God said, bring this up. I'm going to just listen to him. Can I do that? Would you bring those scriptures up, please, Keegan? Because we want to take the word of God and put that first place in our lives. Do you understand that? We understand that, don't we? So bring that up because we're going to pray these, but uh, we're going to pray it in, in Ephesians chapter 1, and you can look up and we'll all pray it together. But I'm not going to go real slow at it. I like to move at it. and You know what I mean? But you all know what we're praying, don't you? So uh, tell me, there you go. But we're going to read that in the Amplified, and then what we're going to do, we're going to do it in the the King James, and that is going to be Ephesians 3. So let's start here. I always pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation that gives you a deep and personal, intimate insight into the true knowledge of him. For we know the Father through the Son. And I pray that the eyes of your heart, the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, flooded with light by the Holy Spirit, so that you will know and cherish the hope, the divine guarantee, the confidence, expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, God's people. Again, to know an unlimited and surpassing greatness of his active spiritual power is in us who believe. These are accordance with the working of his mighty strength, which he produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, whether angelic or human, and far above every name that is named, above every life that can be conferred, not only in this age, but in the world and also which is coming. Amen. Now, and he put what? All things in every in subjection under Christ's feet, and appointed him as supreme head, head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him, fills all things. Is that good or is that good? See, when you read it now, and your ears are hearing that that's going into you, into you, and that's what you want. Now we're going to go to Ephesians 3, please. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with his might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length, the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to that power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Do you realize what you just fed your spirit? Do you know how rich that is? 
Oh, it is awesome. Father, we thank you. We just give this to you. We thank you for taking it, Father God. Your message, Father God, you've always got in abundance to the full, to the overflow for us. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Amen, amen, amen. I want to make sure I get it. First of all, hey, Dee Dee, have you got $10? Could I have it, please? See, she, she carries money. If I came to some of you, you would say, you would say, I don't carry money because if they ask for it, then I'm going to give it. No, no, always be ready. Thank you, thank you. Come here, come here, come here. Come on, race it, race it. That's for you. You know those jeans you had on that picture? Did you see the ripping? You got to get some. <laughs> but, 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 you know, that I, I wouldn't have paid 10 for those. But we pay a good price. You pay a good price for those. Hey, come on, you guys. Is that right? We pay a very good price for that. So now what I want to do this morning, we're going to have fun. We had some fun. But to me, this is one of the most important messages you will ever hear in your life. This is the most important message. Don't raise your hands. Don't. Just in your mind, when you die, are you going to go to heaven? Don't. Are you going to go to heaven or are you going to go to hell? That's what you're going to decide when you're listening to this. Okay, Benny Hinn is going to be speaking on this DVD. And I love it. He's going to be speaking at Andrew Womack's conference as well. We've got to listen to something in here that's really important because this is the reason that God had me bring this out. Gunnar, come here. I want you to hold this up. Hold it up and stand. Now, can you all see that? How is your pendulum? Turn a little bit so they can see it all over. Can you all see that? Is yours away from God that much? Is yours away from... Where is yours? When you came to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, were you on fire for God? And then... Here you are. You're on fire for God. Hold it nice and tight up there. You're on fire for God, and then all of a sudden, you went back, back a little bit at a time, back to your old life. And you started becoming offended at people and at God. Because see, if you get offended at a Christian, you're becoming offended at God. So how far do we go before we go to hell? How far do we go? How far can we get away? Because Paul said, by grace you are saved, but you can lose that. Paul was very concerned, and he wrote over two-thirds, well, over half of the New Testament, and he was concerned he would lose his salvation. Now, if he would think that, do you think we should really listen to this and get, we think we're saved and everything is good, right? But we've got to look. So here we are. We want to be right up there. Everything focused on him. Everything give to him. But it's so hard to do, Pastor Jan. I know it. Thank you, sweetheart. I'll put this back here because you don't want to clunk it against your brother. But if, if kids aren't awake, you pinch them. You pinch them. You pinch them. Howard Brown, what was his name? Rodney Howard Brown. He pinched his kids. Ooh, and after a while, he, I, he didn't pinch them on the arm. He pinched them right where it hurts. But anyway, um, what God is doing us is he's challenging. I prayed God when I listened to this a bit ago because the Lord said, you have got to tell the people. Why? Because too many people have gone away from me. And they've gone back to their old habits. Where are you? Where did you come from? I came from alcoholism. I come from swearing. I come from smoking. I came, do you see it? And I'm sure I was lying there too. Are we going back to those things? Are we going back to drinking, smoking, lying, uh, um, gluttony? 
what? And, and that's something I got to work on because I like to. Mm, mm, mm. No, no. God said that's going away from me because this is the temple. He paid a price for you, didn't he? Okay. So Paul is coming. Come back. So what has become important to you? What is important to you? Who do we seek first? God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things will be given unto you. What is the last thing we're supposed to be concerned about as far as God is concerned? Money. Why? Because he, supply, he said, I will supply all of your money. And no matter how you work and what kind of money you have, if I didn't supply it, you're going to be miserable. That's why Abraham said, I don't want any of your money. I don't want any of your money. I want everybody to see that God has supplied my every, And he was very rich. All of these people in the Bible were very rich that followed him. Isn't that amazing? So is God jealous? He's a jealous God. And he loves every one of us. He wants every one of us to go to heaven. He wants us to be with him. But we have got to have a fellowship, a relationship with him. And if we don't have that, What's going to happen to us? I don't know. I can't judge you. We have to judge ourselves according to him. Because he said, me first, God first, then our spouse, then our children. Not our work. No, no. Never comes before your children. No, no. Got it? We've got to do it God's way. And then he says, now, I've given you a talent, and you're you're going to work that talent, and you're going to make money because that money is not to support you. That's a seed to sow that I support you. Am I, are you on with me? And that's the increase right there through the offering, right? Okay, so God is jealous. Our Father, we pray that our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Ooh, what, 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 what? When was this prayer prayed? Our Jesus who walked in the flesh, prayed this with the disciples. And he said, this is what we're going to pray right now so that when I go into hell, I am going to raise up out of hell. As he prayed other scriptures. So he said, I am the kingdom. Him, him, not, not Pastor Chan. I can't even breathe on my own. Okay, but he, he, he said, I am going to come back, and that word that I'm speaking is what's going to bring me back. He wanted them to spend time with them praying. Did they do that? They all fell asleep. Hey, is everybody awake? If you're not awake, go stand in the back. I'm serious. This is so good, you don't want to miss none of it. You know, if you died today, where would you go, heaven or hell? Oh, I'd go to heaven. Don't be so sure. We're going to listen to this, and we're going to get understanding. Okay? So... Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Wait a minute. When did that happen? Did the second coming come already? How do I know that? Because the first one was when Jesus Christ came and he was born in this earth. Right? Right. You got me. Then the second one was what? When he went into hell and his very own prayer brought him up out of hell. The kingdom has come, and now he has the time and the season. That's, what's, that, that's his deal. We don't. He's the boss. Now, he has given us what? The authority on this earth, the authority over our own body. See, our, our flesh is our enemy. Did you know that? Your flesh will pull you right back into sin, right back into self-centeredness. Where did I put that little book? This, this is by Andrew Womack. This is one of the best books. I say that everyone, don't I? But this self-centeredness, you've got to read it. You've got to say, is that me? I'm serious. Do you want to end up in hell? Who wants to? Then you better listen up because you're going to decide today what you're going to do. But you have to start praying for other people. You've got to be here because this great revival, that's the church. That's the church. That's us. Right? Well, Pastor Jan, I don't believe any of this. Well, Benny Hinn is going to give you scripture that's going to back up what I'm saying. And it's because I, I used to believe that. 
I, do you just know they're in the kingdom? Yeah, they slid back in their whole lifestyle. But when you follow the scripture and you find out, ooh, forgive me, Lord. So we have to be responsible. Where is our flesh? But what, what our kids are seeing, what are our kids seeing us and are we sending them to hell? Is there hell in the hallway in our homes? Are our children going to, do you see what I'm saying? But here, center, self-centeredness, the source of all grief. And it is, because you'll never have peace, love, and joy. So it's time for us to, to have our harvest come in. See, God put this here, Bible. Does this ever change? Is it the same yesterday, today, and forever in Hebrews? Does he say in Malachi? He never changes as well. Does, is he the same? This never changes, right? Does a newspaper change every day? Do we change every day? But do we change with this? Do we change with this or do we change with the world? Who do we change with? Well, I'm going to do it my way. I don't have to do that. I'm my own person. Yeah. But are you going to heaven or hell? Christians going to hell? You got to listen. You got to find out for yourself. This, this is so serious. And you know what? And I said, God, why don't you tell the people? He said, do you love them? And I said, yes, I do. He said, if you love them, you will tell them. I said, I'm ready. I'm ready. You know, do you know why people don't like to come to a church like this who's teaching the word? You know why? Because they have to be accountable. Right? Right? Now, think about this. Being accountable, but what are they surrounded with? Is it the truth? Now, you tell me, when you have a problem, who do you go to? When you have a problem and you hit the wall, where do you go? Do you have somebody to lean on? Yeah. If you don't, and you got to call me, and I got to pray for you, you're in trouble. You understand what I just did? And I get a lot of those calls, and I pray with people, and I see miracles, but they never come because they don't want to be accountable because they want to continue to live the life they're living. Why do people not go to church? Because I'm so busy. I got to do this. I got to do that. But God says, first, first, first. He wants us in church with him. So we bring our gifts together. We bring our gifts together. But what have they got to give to me? You don't know, but during that praise and worship, there is stuff happening in other times. It's happening. You wait, you watch, you'll see, because God is good. So God is jealous. He wants every one of us. This Bible is universal, and that means the church. God wants all of our churches to all operate in this and not in our own religion. I was in a religion, right? You all know I was in the Catholic religion. That is, they killed Christians. They, they, they killed Christians. I got the Bible. I got the Catholic Bible. Now, right here is what we should be going by. And so many of these have changed too. But that's why you've got to go back to the original, and get what God says. It's all about God. It's not about us. So when you think of, of uh, what God has given to us, but I, remember I said to you, I want you to get, well, we were talking about this on Wednesday night. What does your covenant with God mean? What does your covenant with God mean? It means I'm born again. I can do anything I want. Yes, you can. He gave you that free will. But, but, where's my little pendulum again here? God just says, did you become offended? Did you? Sam, did you become, did you, Sam? Oh, it's just a little. It's just a little. Remember Kim, the brownies? They put a little dog poop, I think it was. Just a little dog poop in the brownies. I'll make a pan of brownies, and I'm going to bring, bring them here. I will. I'll make two pans, one with the poop in and one without, and you got to decide which one you want to eat. Who 
which one would eat any one of them? You'd be stupid. You'd be, be no, just a little, just a little. Because you're not offended with people. What did he tell Paul? Paul, why do you persecute me? Paul was persecuting the Christian. But when you persecute a, persecute a Christian, you're persecuting God. Go to the scripture. What happens? A little at a time because you're so self-centered. But I'm going to do it my way. You can do it your way. You really can't. I really don't care. I don't because I cast all those cares on him because he cares for me. But you know what I want to do? I want to keep my mind, this flesh, under control. That's what I want to do. God is so good to me. I want to always go forward. I don't ever want to go back. I have never since I got born again went back to alcohol. I never did and I never will because it will take you. It's, I'm not kidding you. My sister went to the hospital two or three times to get dried out and every time after a while back home, right back at it. And then she died of it. Drank herself to death. True? Yeah. That's not me. I'm not going to mess with the devil. The thing of it is, we have the authority, but are we taking the authority according to the word of God? You've got to take the word of God and don't do it your way, do it his way. Sometimes I don't like to do it his way, you girls. I don't like to. But do you know why I'm going to? Because I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to be obedient. Why? Because I'm going to get blessed. And I'm going to put this flesh under because this is my biggest enemy. So now, what we're going to do, I want you to take some notes. Take down the scriptures, anything, please, and listen to this. Because you pull out the points. And you can go on YouTube and you can listen to this again. But God is not fooling around. Oh, Pastor Jan, I just don't believe this. You don't have to. And if you want to leave now, you can leave. I really don't care. I care about your soul. I care about your children, your children's children. How are they, like they say, what, what is that saying, Didi? Buttercup. Suck it up, buttercup. That was Thursday morning. We have fun on Thursday morning. Girls, you should all be there. It is, it's not only a Bible study, but it's a counseling. It is awesome. Guys, you cannot come. So anyway, would you please bring up Pastor Benny Hinn, take your notes, and with all you're getting, get understanding. Chapter 8, I want to begin reading at verse 12, and I pray the Lord will use this word to really minister to you, all of you tonight, here and around the world. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Bless the Holy Spirit. Help me minister this word. Enable your people to receive it. In Jesus' name and God's people said amen. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. This is a most important and most searching verse. There are five things that catch our attention here. Number one, who is he talking to? The person addressed. Number two, the frightening warning. Number three, 
the duty of the listener, the duty of those who are reading this, listening to it. Number four, the helper that God provides us. And number five, the promise God has given us if we keep it. So number one, who is he talking to? When he says, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the spirit do mortify or put to death the deeds of the body, ye shall live. But he's talking to believers because in verse 1, he says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. In verse 2, he says, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. In verse 4, he says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. In verse 5 and 6, he says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. He continues by saying, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And then in verse 12, he says, Brethren, therefore brethren, he's not talking to unbelievers. So we see verse 1, verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, verse 12. He's talking to us. And he says, if ye, meaning church, meaning believers, live after the flesh, ye shall die. So what he says is, it is possible to die after you've experienced life in Jesus. After we have known life, he says, you can die. If you choose to live after the flesh. And now in verse 12, we go back to verse 12 and says, he says to us, brethren, brothers, sisters, the church, we are debtors not to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything to live after the flesh. So what he says to us is, church, brethren, Believers are debtors to God, not to the flesh. Why? Well, because he gave us life. Why? He gave us his Holy Spirit. And we owe him our life. We owe him our existence. Jesus shed his blood and bought us. Therefore, our life does not belong to the flesh or ourselves. Our life is his. So Paul says, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh. We are not debtors to live after the flesh. Because our life belongs to Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God. They are God's. They belong to the Lord. So my body is not my own. 
I do not owe the flesh anything. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 says, we are his workmanship or creation, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Again, I owe my life to the one who bought it. I owe my life to the one who created it. For he says that I am his creation, you are his creation, created in Christ Jesus. Having brought us back from death to life, having renewed us, continues to renew us into his image, having adopted us as sons and daughters, we owe him our life. We owe him our strength. We owe him our service. And our obedience to the Lord is a debt we owe to him. Our obedience is a debt we owe. You say, what do you mean? Luke 17 tells you exactly what this means. In Luke 17, verse 10, the Lord Jesus says, So likewise, ye, when ye shall have done, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. So our obedience is a debt we owe him. Why? Because he gave us life. He created us. We are his workmanship. We don't owe the flesh anything. Because the flesh did not give us life did not give us anything. Now, wait a minute. There's a big difference between, between living in the flesh and living after the flesh. Living in the flesh is a description of sinners who never entered the kingdom. For Paul says, when we were in the flesh, when we were in the flesh, we lived according to the world, meaning prior to our salvation, we lived in the flesh. Today, though, believers cannot live in the flesh, but they can go after it. Living after the flesh means you choose your old life. You choose to be governed by the old man. You choose to be ruled by the old nature. So Paul says, if you choose to live after the flesh, you will die twice. You'll die because you were dead and you're going to die again. That's scary. That's scary. Now I'll explain that in just a moment, but I'm just showing you clearly we owe the flesh nothing. We owe the Lord everything. And Jesus says to us, so when you've done all those things which are commanded you, all you can say is, we are unprofitable servants. We've done that which was our duty to do. I owe God my life, for he gave it to me. Everything I have, he gave me. When it comes to my Christian life, he gave me life. 
He forgave my sin. He delivered me from darkness. Brought me into his light and liberty. He gave me peace and joy I never knew existed. He set me free from the chains of Satan. He delivered me from demons that controlled my life before I knew the Lord. Without Jesus, I have no life. Without Jesus, I have no purpose for living. Without Jesus, it's better to have not been born. I owe him everything. And Paul the Apostle makes a most amazing statement in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. He says, For the love of Christ constrains us, because we thus judge, that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What it says is quite simple. If Jesus died for us, we must die for him. In that he died for all, that they which live should not from now on live unto themselves, but live unto him who died for them and rose again. So it's clear what Paul meant in Romans 8, 12. We are not debtors to the flesh. We are not debtors to live after the flesh. Our debt belongs to God. We owe him our life. We owe him our service. We owe him our love and faithful service and love. We owe him our obedience. Now, let's just talk a little more about the danger of going backwards. The danger is so serious. First of all, we're going to look at Galatians chapter 6. And the reason I'm bringing this word to you is because I think about this all the time for me. I take this very seriously when it comes to my soul. You have to hear me well now. If Paul the Apostle said, He could be denied and cast away. What chance do we have? For Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, if I don't bring my body under subjection, I will be a cast away. I feel like I must read that for someone now. Even though I wasn't planning on it, I got to tell you, 1 Corinthians 9, 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Or disqualified. Are you telling us, Benny Hinn, that you can go to hell? Absolutely yes. If I choose the old life, I will die. If I choose to go backwards, I'm a fool. Listen here. 
My mother and my father made the decision to bring me into this world. But to go into the next, my decisions, and only my decisions. That's my choice. No one has made that choice for me. I made the choice to live and not die. And to stay alive in Jesus and not die. When I read that verse, it makes me tremble. That Paul the Apostle says that he could lose everything. And I think I can make it without doing what he says I need to do. To bring my body under subjection. To bring my life under subjection. The cost is high. I'll gladly pay it. No, no. I will not end up in hell. I've decided to pay the ultimate price if need be. I will succeed. You say, how? It's my decision. And God will help me fulfill it. Now we have to understand if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body you live. I can't do it on my own then. I need His help. I need His power. I can make that decision. He gives me the enabling. He gives me the power to fulfill my decision. Eternity is a long time. To burn in hell forever is a long time. And yes, my brother and sister, it's real. Do you really want to spend eternity in hell? If you do, you're a blinded fool. Why live in misery here and burn eternally there? For what? Why be born? Why did my parents bring me into this world so I can live miserably and burn in hell eternally? Never. Never. We choose our destiny. If you choose sin, you will die. You will die. Even though now you're born again, you will die. For the second time. You'll be dead in your sin and trespasses for the second time. Now, I was saying earlier, and I want to go back to it, Galatians chapter 6. Here's how it begins. Here's how the danger begins. For any Christian. Well, let's go back to verse 7. I think it gives us the full message. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let us not be weary in well-doing. That's talking to me every day. Don't give up, Benny. Let us not be weary in well-doing. In due season we shall reap if we faint not. Don't give up. We're almost home. But the problem is, People are neglecting what's important. They are sowing into the flesh every day by watching filthy programs on television, by reading filthy magazines, but by watching pornography, by listening to filth left and right. That is sowing to the flesh. Listen to me. You know, you people know how to keep your body fit by going to the gym. 
You know how to discipline your body by walking every day so you, you don't die with heart disease. You ride your bicycle so you don't gain weight. You know, all the rest of it comes with it. You don't want to die sick, so you, you, you do what you know physically by eating right and riding your bicycle or going to the gym or walking. That's called discipline. Discipline. It's good. It's good. You discipline your body. You cannot discipline your flesh. You kill it. You can discipline your body. You cannot discipline the flesh. It cannot be disciplined. The flesh is enmity. Enmity against God. Listen now, listen, listen. You can reconcile with an enemy. You cannot reconcile with an enmity. Let's say it again. You can reconcile with an enemy. You cannot reconcile with an enmity. And Satan is more than an enemy. He's the source of your enmity against God. Are you getting this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You cannot reconcile with an enmity. Satan is the source of enmity. He's more than an enemy. He's way more than an enemy. He's the very father of enmity. He's the source of it. Now Jesus warned us. He warned us. And I take his warning so seriously, it makes me shake in my knees. It makes me shake in my heart. Because I know how deadly the flesh is. How deadly the flesh is. I can resist the devil. That's easy. That's really easy. It says resist the devil with the word and he goes. Nowhere does it say resist the flesh. It says kill it. You say how? I'm going to tell you. Just give me time. Let me show you what Jesus said. He says, take heed. Look at verse 35 of Luke, Luke 11. He said, take heed, therefore, that the light in you doesn't become darkness. Take heed. Be careful that the light you think you have can turn to darkness in one day. So it goes back to my message from Romans 8:13. If you choose to live after the flesh, you will die. But if you, through the Holy Spirit, he, through the Holy Spirit, will put to death the deeds of the body, you live. How, Lord, how? I'm getting there. But I have to go show you the warning. I, I showed you, number one, who is he talking to? You, me. But now I'm also pointing something else in that list. The warning. Well, what is the warning? The warning is, uh, remember Lot's wife, boys? Remember Lot's wife, girls? Jesus in Luke 17, 32 said, don't forget Lot's wife. She looked back. She was gone in a minute. It takes one look. Wham! You're in. You're hooked. You're done. You're dead. One look. And they, the angels warned them, if you look back, can't help you. She looked back. She could not free herself from that lust of the eye. She couldn't free herself from the lust of the flesh. She couldn't free herself from the pride of life. She was bound to it. Bound to it. Like some people here listening to me. And Jesus said something very important to us. 
Oh, how I pray the Lord is using this to talk to you, and I think he is. I can feel it in the atmosphere. He said, take heed to yourselves. Take heed to yourselves. Lest at any time your hearts become overcharged, loaded over with surfeiting, with partying out there, listening to the world and their music, and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, so that day they will come upon you unaware. Take heed to yourselves. What you do with your days, with your nights, with your life, don't get so overcharged. Don't get so weighed down with your parties and your drunkenness and the cares of your life so that they will snatch you away. Now, the flesh, the flesh. What am I talking about when I say the flesh? Well, let me tell you what the Bible means by the flesh. What the Bible means by the flesh is that corrupt nature. The corrupt nature that you entered this world with. You were born with it in you. Where did it come from? Your parents. Where did it come from? Their parents and their parents and their parents. From Adam. Now what we have to understand is something very important. When God created Adam, that old nature was not there in him. Because the Bible says, when God created man, he said, very good. Well, he couldn't have said very good if that man was already corrupt with that old nature. But here's what the Bible says. The most intriguing, eye-opening, revealing verse. And it's found in Ecclesiastes 7. Maybe you've never read that verse, 29. It says, this only have I found, that God hath made men upright, but they sought out many inventions or schemes. When God, are you listening, people? When God who created Adam, he was upright. And the devil offered him that enmity. Remember I said the devil is the source of it? He came and said, Adam, look at this thing here. Oh, yeah, it looks good. Mmm, tastes good. The lust of the eye and, yeah, you got it. The flesh and the pride of life. And he rebelled against God's command and lost the purity of his heart and lost the uprightness of his soul and lost the glory of God and discovered how naked and wretched he was. When sin entered into that man's heart, he discovered the results of it. That, my brother and sister, every human being ever since has been born with it. That evil nature, that lust of the eye and lust of the flesh and pride of life is in every baby born on this planet. And that nature is still in us. We will be free from it at the coming of the Lord. So what do I do? Kill it! How? I'm getting there. Remember what I said. Enmity against God. In Romans 8, look, you better face the facts. If you don't do what, I, what the Bible tells us, you will burn in hell. Including the fact you've been born again. 
if you go back into the old life, you will die. That simple. It's not talking to unbelievers when he says that in Romans 8. It's talking to you, to me. Romans 8, 7. A carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can be, for they that are in the flesh cannot please God. And when he talks about those in the flesh, he means unbelievers. But you're not in the flesh, in verse 9 he says, but in the spirit. So be that the spirit of God will in you. And if any man have not the spirit of Christ, is not of his. We know that. But there is still that verse 13 in the same chapter. If you live after the flesh, you'll die. But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you'll live. Now, this is so important to, to grasp. The flesh is the erring, it cannot be reconciled. It's the irreconcilable uh, enemy of holiness, quite simple. The flesh is the, is the womb where all sin is conceived. When we talk about that carnal man, the Bible calls him the old man or the flesh. What is the flesh? The flesh is the womb, Gregory, where every sin was born in. Every sin was conceived in it. Every sin, Bruce, was formed in it. That's the flesh. It's the womb of sin. Think what Paul is saying here. That some people actually will choose to go back. No. To live after the flesh means a person who is saved begins to live like the sinners do, and his conducts become worldly. His life becomes dominated by the fallen nature again. He is now governed again by the evil nature. And here's the saddest thing of all. The glory of God suddenly means nothing in his life. The second they go back, they care nothing for the glory of God. The glory of God now means nothing to them. The flesh becomes all in all in their life, and that's all they care about. That lust. That lust. You wonder why Paul the Apostle tells us Wow. In Romans 6, 12, he says, now listen here. Let not sin reign in your mortal body. You as a Christian can still say no. Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in the lusts thereof. You know, it's about lust, isn't it? The Bible says the flesh lusts against the spirit. There's a war going on in your life, in your heart. And Paul says, don't let sin rule, reign, and become king in your body, and you obey the lusts of it. What are the lusts of the flesh? The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh. Right of life. Oh, this looks so good. I want it. 
Oh, this tastes so good, I want it. Oh, I am well known now. I am famous. Really? I got followers on Instagram. More than anybody. A lot of life. Someone looks at a woman, lusts after her, the lust of the eyes. Lust of the flesh, mula, no money, so I can spend it. A lot of life, people know who I am. That's the womb of all sin. So Paul says, listen here, you want to make heaven? Don't let sin reign in your body, and don't you dare obey the lusts in it. And then he makes a powerful statement. He says, you choose. Verse 16, don't you know that you whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, you'll be his slave and servant once you obey them? Whether you obey sin and you die, or you obey righteousness and you live. Every day, every day, the devil offers you that filth. Every day you live, every day we live, me included, all of us. He comes at us from all corners, bombarding our life and soul with filth. You can't even escape it. But you have the power say no never don't even entertain it don't even think about it this is there thrown at you from all corners you can't even get on a plane without somebody in front of you watching filth so you have to look through the window so you don't see that filth. I was sitting fly on a plane not long ago, and that fellow was watching filth right in front of me, in the seat in front of me. I had to look to my window and keep my eyes on my Bible the whole time. Four hours of it, he saw filth, demonic movies he was watching. And I got angry. I said, what? You can't even escape it. What, are you supposed to walk with, with, with blindfolders on? No, no, you make the decision. Ah! I won't see you there. Like David, you say, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Because he'll trap you, he'll trap me. That's what Paul means. I put under my body. I put it under subjection. I say, you're not going to go there. And you can't go to the desert like the old priest and lock yourself in a cave. You're not going to escape either. Well, you want to become a monk? Think you're going to escape now, huh? Live in some cave in the Sinai. No, no, no. It's all, it's all around you. You have power. It says so. Not to yield to it. Know ye not, is this getting through to you? Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants, once you obey, you become the slave of that sin, the servants of that sin. Wow. The servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of, of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. So it's a matter of life and death. Okay. So back to Romans 8.13. If you live after the flesh, you're going to die. But here's the scariest one of all. I read that not long ago, and it made my heart tremble. And I think that's what Paul was crying in Philippians. But he would not go there. He says in Revelation 21, but the fearful, and un this is Revelation 21, 8, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, whoremongers, sorcerers, idolaters, or liars 
shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You see, the saints will arise from the dead when Jesus comes. That's the first resurrection. The first resurrection. But millions upon millions upon millions will stay dead in the grave for another thousand years. And while Jesus reigns on earth with glory, there will be hundreds of millions, possibly billions of people still buried. A thousand years are over. They will be all raised from the dead, judged and thrown into the lake of fire. That's the second death. Paul cried in Philippians that I might attain to the first resurrection. In Philipp- read it there in Philippians 2. 3, excuse me. That I might attain to the first resurrection. Because if I rise with the saints, I'm free from the second death. That's our hope. Lift your hands to the Lord Jesus. Don't let me. Say, don't let me fall. You're able to keep me from falling. Say it. And you're able to present me blameless in your presence. But now, now, let's, 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 let's deal with, with something that I think is very important. We have a job to do. What is, what is our job now? The Holy Spirit will not help us unless we act first. Don't you remember what I just said earlier? It doesn't say the Holy Spirit through you. It says you through the Holy Spirit. Meaning you act first and then he comes and gives you the power. He through you, he starts it and finishes it. You through him, you start and he finishes it. Are you getting this? So the new birth, he through me. The new birth, he did it all. He convicted me, brought me to the kingdom, and saved my soul. That's through me. He, the Holy Ghost, through me. But the second one, to live holy, I have to go through him. Romans 8, 13, if you through the Spirit, you through, meaning you start, you begin, you act first. How? Stop sowing to the flesh. Galatians 6, one more time. I got to hit it back. I got to keep, keep hitting it because my brother, my sister, most people don't hear it the first time around. They gotta, you you got to repeat it. Repetition is important because most people aren't even paying attention. He that soweth to the flesh, Galatians 6, 8, he that sows to the flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. So no more. Corruption. No more listening to all that filth out there and listening to it out there. It's polluting your soul. That's the stronghold demon build in you. You just gave them the weapons they need to destroy you with. When you bring the world into you, you give them what they need to destroy you with stronghold in your mind, in your life. But there is hope. How? Here it is. Here it is. Colossians 3, verse 5, tells me, verse 5 and 6, Colossians 3, 5 and 6 is a golden, beautiful thing. It says, mortify. You still can. Mortify, put to death. Therefore, your members which are on the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. The word inordinate means passions. Evil, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. What do you do? Mortify your members. Mortify your members. Means subdue. It means don't serve them. And here's the biggest one. Starve them. 
starve the flesh. You can discipline your body by eating less. You can discipline your body and lose weight by eating less. You can make yourself strong physically by walking or riding a bicycle or going to the gym. Fine. But the flesh, starve it. Starve it. Don't even give it a glass of water. Don't even give it a drop of water. Don't even give it a drop of nothing. Let it die with starvation. Lift your hands. Father, give them that. Give them that power they need to starve that flesh in them. Give them the will. Give them the desire to starve it till it dies. To starve it till it dies. To deny it completely till it dies. In Jesus' wonderful name. Because listen to me. This is a war. A spiritual war. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. And Paul says... In Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But how do I walk in the spirit? Starve it. Starve the flesh and feed the spirit. Don't sow to the flesh, sow to the spirit and reap life. And when you sow to the Spirit by reading your Bible and praying, calling on God and going to church and doing the right things God wants you to do, you'll grow in the Lord and in the faith. You'll get stronger than the flesh. Then you'll starve it and you'll know how to starve it because you don't need it. Remember, you don't owe it anything. You don't need the flesh. You need your body. You don't need the flesh. Say, I don't need it. Say it again. Say it again. Say, I don't need the lust of the eye. I don't need the lust of the flesh. And I don't need the pride of life. I'm fine. You don't need it. Because Jesus gives you that and more. Jesus will give you way more than the world can offer you. Way more. And there's no lust in it either. It's pure glory. But Paul makes a stunning statement in verse 17. He says, because now if you don't walk in the spirit, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit lusts against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. Why? It's a war. But you can be led by the spirit. You can walk in the spirit and the flesh will not have any dominion over you. It says so. Walk in the spirit. How? Feed it. Feed your inner man with the word of God. And once you do that, then you understand Romans 8:13. Ye through the spirit, you through the spirit, you act, and he takes over and gives you the enabling and the power to do it. You, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, you're going to live. So, so, how do I also starve the flesh? Uh Uh-huh. By having no fellowship with it. Having no fellowship with it means no more heathens around you. Some of you have heathens. As friends, you like your heathen friends, then you're going to die. Real die. Not to the world, you're going to burn in hell. You say, you're too tough in him. I have nothing to lose. And all to gain. By telling you that, I want you to live, not die. That's God's will for all of us. It says you have no, the command, have no fellowship. Ephesians 5.11, Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but expose them. Reprove them. 
What does reprove mean? It means expose them. Tell them you're living in sin. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. <sighs> That's why we have to remember something here. We, we just cannot do this on our own. We have no strength against the flesh by ourselves. That's why I sang, Holy Spirit, thou art what? I need him. I need him just to preach it. Had I not asked for his help, that message would have gone right on the floor. But you see how attentive you are? Not because I'm, I'm preaching it. He is communicating it to you. He's telling you, this is the truth. Hear it, listen to it. Now, it is your duty to ask him for help. And I promise you, he will be there to help you. Having, therefore, these promises. I'm almost done, but I got to say it. 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore the promises of God, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having now the promises, let's pray what David prayed. Lift your hands, all of you. David knew the danger he prayed this prayer. Repeat after me, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit. So shall I teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted unto thee. Would you promise me to pray that every day? You go read it in Psalm 51 verse 10 and make it your prayer. Say Psalm 51 10. Say it. Say it. Say it. Turn to it. Read it now. Make it your daily prayer. It's my prayer. I pray that prayer more than any prayer in life. I pray that prayer every time. And I want you to read. Yeah, keep it on the screen, brother. Keep it on the screen. I want you to pray that prayer every day. Would you read it for me right now? All right. One, two, three, go. Restore unto me. And keep reading. See, what David knew, he knew our weakness. So he said, Lord, you create in me a clean heart. You renew a right spirit within me because I cannot do it. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of salvation. And hold me up because I can't hold myself up. Hold me up with a willing heart. Give me a willing heart. And then I'll teach transgressors your ways. Including Christians who are transgressing your ways. And sinners will come to the cross. Real gentle there, Gregory. I want to read something. Read something. Real gentle. 
Someone wrote these words. If by the Holy Spirit's enablement and our diligent use of the divinely appointed means, we sincerely and constantly oppose and refuse the solicitation of indwelling sin, then and only then we shall live a life of grace and comfort here on earth and a life of eternal glory and bliss hereafter. Wow, that fits my message, so I had to write it down. An old father of the church wrote this, a prayer he wrote in his book. He said, if by the Holy Spirit's enablement and our diligent use of the divinely appointed means, we sincerely and constantly oppose and refuse the solicitation of indwelling sin, then, only then, we shall live a life of grace and comfort here on earth and a life of eternal glory and bliss hereafter. And I want to add one word to it. 1 John 2.25 And this is the promise He hath promised us even life eternal. And I wrote in my notes Come Lord Jesus even so come Lord Jesus Lift your hands say come even so, come, Lord Jesus. No matter what happens in the future, the word of God stands forever. Amen. Wow, wouldn't that shake you up a little bit? I don't want to miss heaven. I don't want to, you know, and we're going to take communion, but just hold it up for a moment. So many of us, we're on fire for the Lord when we come to know him. But then we become weary because we don't see things happening that we expect, don't we? And then we yield ourselves to things of the world. And we get drawn back in. And I think what happens is the way we're raised, we remember that. And we still are with our families. And we get drawn back into that. Well, my family rejected me, so I didn't have to worry about that, getting drawn back into sin. I praise God that I was able to teach my mother. My mother received Jesus, and she was learning right up until the day that she died. I know she's in heaven. Now, looking at some of these, we hold, we're supposed to kill the flesh, hold it back, and that makes sense, doesn't it? Because this You've all got, did you write down the scriptures? Write down the scriptures or go into YouTube. You can find this. And, but what, what is sending people to hell? What is the thing that, that, that is done the most in this world, especially in the valleys? Two bars and one tavern on every corner. No, no, two taverns and one church on every corner. That's what we used to say. Why? Because it's such a drinking state. It really is. At our weddings, we think we're supposed to get drunk, and so that is not what God wanted. And smoking, that isn't what God wanted. God loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son. So the only thing we have to do is ask him into our heart. But, did you hear what I said? Only, no, but then we have to get a relationship with him. And then we've got to follow him. And then... This stubbornness, I got stubbornness. This, Pastor Kenny can uh, attest, I used to be so stubborn, I wasn't going to do it. But finally, I had, to, I had to get rid of the stubbornness because that was holding me from learning more of what God had for me. And I love what God has done with me because a little at a time, and I'm still giving stuff over, you guys. I'm still giving over the... You tell me, does everybody have something in here they're going to work on? Did, did this help any of you? Because, now, I've listened to it more than once. And I wrote down the scriptures, and I went through the scriptures. And I repented to God. I repented, and I just felt so clean. But I'm not done yet. Because this flesh, 
wants to take me back. I don't want to go back with the flesh. I want to go forward. Do you too? Yes. yes. So now, what, there's a lot of lying going on in this world. You look at our government, it's lies. How about people? Do people lie? Do children lie? That is one of the biggest evils in this world. Do you know that? You know what? I love it when I told my kids, if you get in trouble, come and tell me. Or if I, you know, talk to you, tell me. But don't lie, because then I'm going to lose trust in you. Because lying is the devil now is using us. And that path will get just worse and worse. So lying you belong to the devil. Do you realize that? I mean, think about it. Because the devil is the father of all lies. This is hard. It's hard for me to say these things, but I told God that I would say whatever he wanted me to say. And I'm going to do it. So, steal. Stealing. Are we stealing? Are we stealing from our employer? Are we stealing from our employer? Not goods, but time. Are we busy on cell phones instead of doing our job? You see what I'm saying? That's the things you all have to look at. How about caring for our children? How about we give them a cell phone? Do you know I still think that's one of the worst things in the world for a child? Because there is so much dirt and filth on there that it just, it's just amazing. But you have to close your eyes and look away. Just think riding on that plane, Benny, he did for four hours. And the man ahead of him. But now what he did gets sowed into his children and his children's children. So whatever I take in, I sow that because that goes in the blood. Unless I repent of it. So where do you want to go, heaven or hell? And he's going right down to how we eat. So, you know, all the goodies out there, there's so much stuff out there. I know it's not good, it's going to kill me. But he doesn't want this body to die. So number one, what does he want us to do? We all know what he wants us to do. But it's up to us if we do it. Okay? He commands it. And then he turns around and says, because you have a free will, you can do whatever you want. He said, attend service. Why would you want to attend services every week, every Sunday? You know why? Because coming together to build that strength. It's his commandment, not mine. This is all his. Then the next times he says, give tithes and offerings. That's his. See, he wants to get the blessings to you. He wants to get the blessings not only of, of coming together, but he wants to get the blessings of tithing offerings. So when you give that seed, he wants to give you such an overflow, you don't know what to do with it, that you will ha not have room enough to receive it. Do you know that? Then you're supposed to pray for the pastor in the church. Then you're supposed to serve in the ministries of helps. God says in Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. So are we taking God first? If you make a practice of not coming on Sunday like he said, coming together, then you took him out and you put him here. Okay, I'll go here. Here's God. He's the big guy. And that's what, But we just, here's, here's us. Is this going to work? Here's us. Okay? I want you to look at this, so I want you to get that book. So here is us. But now, I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to pay my tithes and offerings. I'm not going to volunteer in the church. I am not going to, do you see what I'm doing? I'm putting myself, well, that's what he's saying, you guys. Does he want us to have a good, rich, wholesome, beautiful life? Do we have it? Do we have it? Do you have it? How many of you get to bed on Saturday night at a good time or sit and fall asleep in church? I don't like to do things on Saturday night, and I always did that. We always did that. When we had the kids and up at the cottage, remember, we'd have 12 to 20 to some kids. They all had to go to church with us. Remember that? At the They had to go to church. 
That's, we think we can skip and just lay around. It's going to cost you. You might have a loved one that all of a sudden falls sick and you don't know what to do with. You know, I, I was telling the girls on, on um, Thursday morning, was it Wednesday morning or Tuesday morning that I fell? Okay, I've got, I'll, I just tell you guys everything. I'm, geez, you all know me anyway. Anyway, we have a counter in my bathroom, okay? And it comes up to about here. And I like to put my leg up on the counter and put the oil up so I don't have to reach down, right? Well, I had flip-flops on. So I put my leg up and I'm doing it, and all of a sudden, I lost balance. I flew back, and I landed. The commode is right. You know what the commode is? The toilet. I hit my head. I, I thought I was bleeding. And oh, <laughs> this is, that's looking pretty good. Still black and blue. I thought I, but the bleeding stopped. There's no broken arm. I thought I broke my arm. Then my big toe on my right foot. <laughs> then my back. Okay, so then I was going to go to the, nope. So I said yesterday to the Lord, or Friday night, the Lord said to me, go to the chiropractor. But you said the other day, he said, no, you didn't want to be touched until you got this into shape to be a testimony. Are you kidding me? Okay. So I did. He was surprised to see the kind of, and not have broken bones, and pelvis was still aligned. That's God. But the moment I fell back there, I started to see, you, you, you're getting this? I started, I, did you ever see stars? I'm not kidding you. And you know, all of a sudden you're gone. You're going to pass out. And I rolled on, I couldn't roll this way. I rolled this way. And I said, by the stripes of Jesus, I am healed. And I turned around, got myself on my feet. I don't know how I did it. It had to be the Holy Spirit. And I started walking. I said to the chiropractor, I started walking. He said, you were walking? I said, oh, I started walking, and I was quoting scripture. Oh, he's just standing there looking at me. I am not going to quit. And I said, I've been into the pool twice. You went in the pool? Yeah. You don't, you don't have to take this crap. I couldn't even put a, this morning I could put shoes on that foot. That toe was just wanting to talk back to me. But I'm busy talking to it. You talk to your body. Why? Because I know I have the truth of the word of God, and it sets me free. And that's what I want you all to learn here. You know, that's what we got. How many people have you been able to help? How many people that you have been able to help with their healing or with coming to know Jesus or whatever? Think about that. That's what I want to do. But they can receive it and they can be healed, or they can get born again. But if they don't get a relationship with God, they're going backwards. I can't help that. So, number one, we have got to seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things will be given on what? See, God does not want, as I said before when I started, God does not want us bragging about how famous we are, how rich we are, everything we got. Abraham, I will take nothing from any of you. It's God who's going to make me rich. Got it? Because you, somebody can give you a lot of money, and you can squander it away and be in worse shape. They said when they won these big, what you call it, stock, yeah, they win the, and they said they were out of money and worse shape than they were to start. Look at football players, basketball players. They got all that money, and they got on drugs, and they lost their family. Money is the root of all evil if you adore money, if you take money first. You will come under it, and it will steal, kill, and destroy from you. God is, did God say it in his word? Say yes, because he did. So what we're going to do is we're going to take communion because we know that we are the winners, right? But now hold it right there. Hold it right there. Hold communion right there. Now, what God told me to do is we have to do some repenting. 
Is there, are there things that spoke to you in this video that you have to repent of? Don't tell me what it is. Don't tell me what it is. Okay? But you go in. What is something that's holding you back? Are you putting your flesh under in situations? Is your cell phone good for you or bad for you? Are you gaming on those things all the time? Even, even you know, there's gaming with computers. Do you know they're proving what it's doing to the cells in the brain? Do you real? Oh, it's not hurting me. If God says it, he means it. Right? Right? What do you need help with? What do you need to repent of? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to think about that. Right? Do you become angry easy? Do you snap real quick? You know, that's, that's the flesh. I had that. Now I'm like, no, you're not going to steal my joy, Satan. I'm going to keep on going. And I do. And I'm going to have fun. So, Father, we come before you. Say, Father, we come before you. In the name of Jesus. Satan, I bind you. In the name of Jesus. Get off of me. Now, which, what one is hampering you? Because you're going to do this when you get home, too. What has held you back? What have you gone back to? Is God not important? Is God not number one every week? Is God not number one? If he's number two, he is jealous. Because you're number one. See this? He will not put up with it. Now, you heard the scriptures. You heard Paul that wrote it. You know. But it's up to us. You know what I, the Lord said to me, too, and we'll finish that. He said, I'm tightening up the ship. I'm tightening up the ship. You know why? Because there is a war going on, and we are supposed to be ready for that war, and we're supposed to be leading that war. And now we are back there having to be led because we're so much into our flesh. Right? So you go up and you clean up with God. But right now, Father, say, Father, I give you everything that's come into my mind that has been holding me back. In the name of Jesus, I receive, Father, your freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're, go we're not going to let this go because we're going to continue on this here because God wants us. Do you want to go to heaven? Who wants to, who wants to go to heaven? Has everybody got their hands up? How are you going to get there? You just heard it. Are you going to sleep for that thousand years? Those who sleep for that thousand years are going to raise up, and what are they going to do? They're going to be judged and sent into the lake of fire. I don't like this, but I am so glad I know. Right? You know, Pastor Kenny, your joke? You and Earl should have put on the back of that truck. What was it? The bridge is out. Well, this is the rest of the story. Just think how happy, how wonderful you're, you will be and how you will pass it on. Look at this. Hey, teenagers, teenagers, you've got a phone. One of these times I want you to bring me your phone and I want to see everything that's on there. How would you like that? Well, I got news for you. Jesus sees everything on your phone that you're looking at. Adults, he's doing the same thing. Everything you're doing, and there's so much dirt on there that they bring up, don't they? That could send you to hell. That could send you to hell. Because you can go so far away, and it's got you. It's not worth it. So we're going to take communion, and we're going to stand on the promises of God, because Father God... We don't give up. Yes, Daddy, I heard that. God said, are you going to take your pleasures over him? Are you going to take your pleasures? Are you looking at me? 
Are you going to take your pleasures over God? Oh, oh, that's pretty good. Well, I got to sleep in. It's Sunday morning. That's the only time I get to sleep in. You don't take your pleasures over God. This is how you get the freedom. God's tightening up the ship, right? What is it, buttercup? You got it. I knew that, but I just got to, I like that. So suck it up, buttercup, meaning get on the right train, right? So now, Father, I thank you. And we're taking this communion because, Father God, you died for us. And we're changing so many things in our life. And flesh, we're telling you, no, I've had enough of you in the name of Jesus. Oh, God, I praise you and I worship you. And I break this now. That, Father God, through your stripes I'm healed. Through your stripes, I'm going to call on you, Holy Spirit, to help us all to put our flesh under and take you first. In Jesus' name, let's eat. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, you are good. Your mercy endures forever. Your mercy is going to do, oh, it's so good. Now, Father, as we take this, this grape juice that simulates, oh, Father God, the blood of Jesus, and as we drink this, Father God, we repent of every evil thing that we have lined up with. Help us to get rid of it. I just give it to you. And now we drink this because we want to always keep in right standing with you. In the name of Jesus, let's drink. Amen. Amen. Well, that's as far as I'm going to go. Um, Wednesday night, what we're going to do, we're going to go to Nancy Dufresne's. God told me to take Nancy, and um, we're going to take a break. I'll give that later. Um, from what we're doing uh, with um, George Pier or with uh, Kenneth Copeland. Okay, so we're going to do Nancy Dufresne. Now, do you want to learn how to be healed? Do you want to learn how to follow God? Do you want to learn? Because I think she is just right on. And there will be nothing impossible for you. And you will be able to help other people to be healed. That's Wednesday night, okay? And I thank you, and that goes from 7 to 8. And I thank you for that, Father. And I plead the blood of Jesus over each one of you. And I speak life in abundance to the full, to the overflow, yes. So now it's up to you if you guys make changes. You can do whatever you want. I'll love you just the same. If you don't want to come to church, you don't have to. If you don't want to give tithes and offers, you don't have to. If you don't want to serve in any ministry, you don't have to. I just give it to the Lord, but I know I'm going to do what he tells me to do. Are you with me? Okay. God bless you. Have a wonderful day, and it will be good.